So uh, the perturbed carbon cycle as we had from last time with, with the atmosphere as sort of the grand central station and then these other sort of lungs of the biosphere, the, of the carbon cycle that, that interact with each other by way of the atmosphere. That sort of sets the stage. And now uh, a budget for CO2 today. There is uh, fossil fuels, fossil fuel combustion, uh, which releases about seven gigatons of carbon per year. So that's sort of the fundamental problem right there is the fossil fuels. Uh, there's another sort of major source of CO2 to the atmosphere, which is uh, deforestation. So I'm going to leave this uh, budget there uh, intact to sort of add to as we go, but just talk about deforestation for a minute. Uh, if you go from forest to agriculture, there is, uh, you start out with more carbon per area and you end up with less carbon per area you know, per acre or per square meter or whatever. So if you cut down a forest and start to grow crops on it, the amount of carbon that is sort of stored in the whole system is, is, is less. So you could imagine uh, carbon per acre as a function of time. Let's say you had lots of carbon in a forest and then you chop everything down and you burn a lot of it so the amount of carbon per acre drops quite a bit so slash and burn or whatever so that's a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere now one thing that's going on is that it, 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 the, the agricultural revolution due to uh, you know use of, of petroleum energy and 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 uh, and energy to produce fertilizers, uh, the, the yield, the crop yield per, per acre of land has gone, gone way up. And, and because of genetic engineering of better crops and, and, and things like that, irrigation. Uh, and so there is a significant amount of land, uh, especially in sort of the temperate latitudes, like in this country and in Europe, which is now going back to forest. This is called uh, reforestation. or a, 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 afforestation, they also call it. I don't know why that means at, you know, making forest. A, abiotic means without life, so afforestation seems like it would mean without forest. But anyway, I think this is what they call it. So if land is starting to go back to uh, forest, it can start to take up carbon because it's, it's transitioning back to more carbon per, uh, per acre. So one of the big uh, sticking points in the negotiations, which for Copenhagen in the next month or so, they were supposed to get together and come up with the next Kyoto. And they just decided, they just announced this morning that, well, maybe we're not going to quite make it this time. Maybe it'll have to happen next time because people are not yet agreeing very well on how to deal with all these issues. One of the issues is uh, whether to allow carbon credits for land use. So if Brazil doesn't cut their forests, they should, I mean, presumably get credit for that. Uh, and if there's land that's going back to forest and it's actually physically taking up CO2, then it seems like countries should get credit for that too. The trouble is that it's very difficult to measure this carbon per acre, how much carbon there is in an acre of land. So I was talking to a guy who was associated with uh, the, the Morton Arboretum, this big forest preserve and, and sort of like a tree garden out, out west of town. And uh, he was all excited about how much money they could make by selling 
the carbon offsets, you know, just by having a forest and claiming that you're increasing the amount of carbon per acre, you know, you could get a lot of money for that, which is reasonable if it's real carbon. But the trouble is that it's, it's, it's very, I mean, if we're talking about making a sort of a, a financial commodity, you know, we talk, start limiting, li limiting carbon emissions, the way that happens is by means of, of, of these carbon offsets and, and, and trading carbon emissions and things like that, making a financial commodity out of it. If you start doing that, and there's all this uncertainty in how much carbon per acre there is in land, then the whole thing seems like it's sort of snake oil to me. And so I'm deeply suspicious when, when, uh, when they start talking about forest uh, credits for, for, for carbon. Anyway, the bottom line is that deforestation contributes something like another 2 billion metric tons of carbon per year to the, uh, to the atmosphere. So it's another source of CO2 uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, so now the question is, where is that carbon going? So now, uh, where does it go to? Well, part of it goes to uh, the atmosphere. So the atmospheric increase is something like four gigatons of carbon per year. And that equals something on the order of two parts per million per year as just sort of another touchstone. So uh, the natural CO2 was 280 parts per million, and now we're at 380 and change. And it's going up by two per year. But uh, you know the total that is being released is nine. And so the atmosphere is only going up about half as fast as it would if uh, that flux was the only thing that's going on. So in order to balance this budget, we have to have fossil fuel carbon being taken out of the atmosphere and going into the land surface and also or also into the oceans. So I'm just going to tell you the answer at the outset because suspense is not really a good thing, I don't think, in, in class lectures. Uh, and then we're going to sort of talk about the, the two different uh, arrows there, the ocean and the land. It turns out that the ocean is taking about maybe two and a half billion metric tons a year. And then there has to be some uptake on land just by process of elimination. If it's not going in the ocean, it must be going into the land someplace. Uh, and so to balance the books, it takes about another two and a half billion metric tons a year. Now maybe you're confused now. You should be. Because here I've got land as a source. And then here I've got land as a sink for CO2. And the answer is that there are different, uh, there are different um, parts of the land surface. So the places where trees are being cut down to do agriculture, this is mostly actually in the tropics is where this is happening. Because the, the forests in Europe and North America were cut down long ago. So they're already gone. And if anything, they may be sort of growing back a little bit. But the places where there's still kind of you know, powerful uh, primeval forests that can be cut down and release carbon is in the tropics mostly, Brazil and Indonesia and, and places like that. So this land uptake, which we only know because it's not in the ocean. It has to be going into the land someplace. Uh, this is called the missing sink. because it's not clear where, where it is. And it's a lot of carbon. So uh, to demonstrate how much carbon it is, I'll, I'm going to calculate the weight of all the people on the world and compare it. So let's say there's 6 billion people 
And uh, let's be generous or you know, malicious, I suppose, and say that the people each weigh 100 kilograms. Just because it's a nice round number. So those of you who are up on your metric system are offended now because I just said that you weigh 220 pounds, uh, which is high for the average you know, weight of people in the world. But it's a nice round number. And then you know, the people cancel out. So we got kilograms. And then, uh, let's see, it's 10 to the ninth kilograms is a ton, is, is, a, uh, is a gigaton. So uh, or better yet, got ahead of myself. A kilogram, there's a thousand kilograms per ton, and then uh, ten to the ninth. tons per gigaton. And uh, so we end up 10 to the ninth, 10 to the ninth. The 6 is still in play. Uh, it's 0.1. So we end up that the, the mass of the whole human race is 0.6 gigatons. And this isn't just our carbon. It's our water and our bones and everything. Uh, so the amount of carbon that's disappearing every year, every year exceeds the weight of all the people on the planet, and yet still we can't find where it's going. That's the weird thing. So where does the missing sink go? Where could it possibly be? Uh, it's on land, we know, because it's not in the ocean. And uh, there are a couple of ideas that people have why the land could be taking up more carbon. So one is called a CO2 fertilization effect. So you know that plants take up CO2 uh, and, and, and water to make their biomass when they do photosynthesis. And so it turns out that if there's more CO2 in the air, the plants grow a little better. There's no guarantee they're going to grow like crazy because they're still limited by water and by nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and you know, fertilizers and things like that. But, uh, you know, one of the purposes of a greenhouse is to have higher CO2 concentrations in the air because then the, the plants just grow better. There's this uh, thing in, the, the, in, in, in Tucson, Arizona called Biosphere 2 that they actually had people living in there. And it was this sort of a cult. It was funded by these oil billionaires. And, you know, they, I went there as a tourist once and they showed this slideshow where they'd photoshopped this thing onto the surface of Mars. They were like, you know, really ambitious. They were going to figure out how to make a a little functioning world. And the CO2 concentration in there got so high that the trees grew so, and also they had a lot of fertilizer. They had sort of like really rich soils. Uh, the trees grew so fast that they couldn't hold themselves up. They had to sort of be propped up uh, because it was, it was the, the CO2 fertilization effect was very, very strong in there. Uh, another possibility is a longer growing season. You know, with warming, which has been going on for the last couple of decades, uh, the, the date when, uh, you know, the, the rivers first thaw in Alaska have been getting earlier. The date when, uh, you know, the, they, they, they define the growing season in certain, you know, using physical parameters like that. And that has been getting longer over the last couple of decades. So one thing I showed you, the, the CO2 concentration with time. which has these annual cycles as the biosphere is sort of breathing, taking up carbon in the spring and then releasing it in the winter. 
Well, the, the, it turns out that if you look very closely at the data, the, the cycles are getting bigger over the years. The biosphere is breathing harder, as if the biosphere is, is becoming sort of larger, taking up some of this carbon. But it's still a mystery where exactly and, and according to what mechanism the, the, the land that's not being deforested is taking up this missing sink CO2. So like the methane concentration, where you can make a prediction, but it's not very good because you don't really understand the mechanism. And so you could easily be wrong. Uh, the same is really true, I think, for this missing sink going into the future. In particular, uh, there is the possibility that uh, higher temperatures lead to uh, faster uh, soil carbon decomposition. So if you go to Brazil and, 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 and look, look at the tropical rainforest, you see lots of carbon. I mean, it's very, very lush. But there actually is very little carbon in the soils there. And that's because if a leaf falls to the soils, uh, you know, fungus grows on it or, or it gets decomposed very, very, very quickly because it's so hot there. Whereas where you find soils that have a lot of carbon in them is in the, the, the cooler high latitudes in northern Canada. You know, that's where peats are. Uh, so that's where, that's where there's a lot of this carbon stored in soil. So do we still have, yes, this 1,500 gigatons of, of carbon in soils could uh, could go away with higher temperatures. So it's it's sort of a it could it could uh, it could it could uh, it could decompose. You know, there's not much organic carbon in tropical soils, and so if we make more of the surface of the Earth have a tropical sort of a climate then there wouldn't be as much carbon in the soils in the high latitudes either. So that's kind of a long-term you know, fear that this, the land surface could actually go that way in the future. So far, it's not. So far, it's helping us out. But we don't understand it very well, so we can't predict what will happen in the future. And there's ways to imagine it reversing and going the opposite direction. And, 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 and uh, releasing carbon. So today, you could call the land a negative, sta a stable ne negative feedback, because we put CO2 into the air, but it's taking it back out. And so it's kind of buffering the climate change. But it could turn into a positive feedback in the future if the soil carbon uh, is respired in a warmer climate. In, in the future. So this leaves us with the ocean. Actually, uh, I mean, that leaves us in the lecture with the ocean. In, in the science, the ocean, carbon uptake into the ocean is much easier to measure than it is going into land. So uh, the way it works out sort of scientifically is uh, that this is the number that's known. And this one is just by difference. So the way CO2 invades the oceans has all to do with, uh, with um, the chemistry of seawater. And the way it works, we start out with carbon dioxide. And when it dissolves in water, it adds a water to make H2CO3, which is called 
carbonic acid. So carbonic acid uh, is called an acid because it can uh, release H pluses. So anything that releases H pluses into water is by definition an acid. H plus is just a chemical like any other, but it just happens to be an aggressive chemical. It reacts with things. So battery acid. I was charging up some batteries over the weekend, and they have sulfuric acid in them. And uh, you know, if I spill that it, on my, my hand, it would burn me because it would react with the, 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 the chemical bonds in my skin. Or if it got on my clothes, it would leave a hole next time I did the laundry. So that's what acids are, is they have lots of H plus. So this carbonic acid has two hydrogens on it, like the water did. Uh, and, but it's such that it can pop off an H plus to make the water acidic. And if you do that, you've got HCO3 minus. So it's got a minus charge, because the hydrogen takes a plus charge. So it leaves behind its electron is what it does. This is called bicarbonate. So baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. So it's just a sodium and then this. Bicarbonate itself can release another H plus to make carbonate. So we've talked before, you've heard about calcium carbonate, which is just a calcium with the CO3, CaCO3. And so that's just putting you know, a calcium ion and this carbonate ion together to make, to make a mineral, which is, which is limestone. So the way that this uh, the way that this chemistry works is uh, kind of wondrous, and, and people can spend their lives people pathetic people like me can spend their lives studying how this works. But we can sum it up in a fairly simple way that uh, when CO2 dissolves into seawater, it reacts with a carbonate ion to make two bicarbonates. This is called a buffer reaction. It turns out that uh, we have the same chemistry in our blood and in our cell, cell plasmas. Uh, it's because you know biology evolved in the ocean. So we sort of are, are all kind of tied together by the same chemistry. Um, this is an equilibrium reaction. So that uh, there is this, um, this, this idea about how to deal with equilibrium reactions called Le Chatelier's principle. That if you add, you start out in equilibrium, so it's sort of balanced. The, 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 the chemicals find the distribution of how much CO2 and carbonate and bicarbonate you want to have, which is the lowest energy state. That's what equilibrium is. It spreads itself out you know, until it's sort of the most comfortable. And then let's say we add some of one of the chemicals in that chemical reaction. So it was in balance, and then, we, then it's out of balance because we put more of something in. What Le Chatelier's principle says is if you add some reactant, the equilibrium shifts to the product side. Or if you were to take away some of the reactant, it would shift back toward the reactant side. So 
you know, we put in more of this, and now there's too much of this, and so it's going to compensate by going in kind of that direction. So this is what happens when fossil fuel dissolves in the ocean. You put more of this in, and it pushes the chemical reaction in that direction. So uh, by pushing it in that direction, it's sort of like, uh, let's see, so CO2 in the air is only aware of the carbon in the ocean that's in this form of CO2. So if we ask if you know, the more CO2 is going to dissolve in water or not, it only depends on how much of this CO2 is there in the water. The equilibrium between the CO2 and the air and the water doesn't care about carbonate ion or bicarbonate. It doesn't see those. It's just between CO2 in the air and CO2 in the water. So when you put some CO2 in the water and then this chemical reaction sort of hides it in this form of bicarbonate, that lets the water take up more CO2. So the reaction with carbonate hides the CO2 uh, in the form of this bicarbonate. So if you hide it from the atmosphere, then more CO2 can come in from the atmosphere. So how much, so this is a good thing. It means that the seawater can hold more CO2 than it could if, uh, if there were none of this buffer chemistry reaction. Now, another d uh, a dissolved gas that we can kind of draw a parallel to is oxygen. Oxygen doesn't have any of this pH chemistry, and there's no sort of buffer for oxygen. Oxygen just dissolves as a gas. It stays as a gas. Goes in, comes out, nothing to it. It's sort of simple, straightforward. Uh, but the amount of oxygen that, that the water can hold is less because of that than it than can hold uh, CO2. So in our blood, we actually had to construct Biology had to construct hemoglobin to carry oxygen around in order to, you know, so you take a breath and, and oxygen dissolves in your blood and then it got to go to your brain where you're thinking about carbon chemistry, which is pretty strenuous. So you've got to have enough oxygen to drive, you know, all of this, this, this chemical reaction. So hemoglobin has to carry that around. But after you uh, respire some of your breakfast in your brain cells, uh, the, the CO2 reacts with the breakfast, the glu glucose or whatever, and it makes uh, carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide can just dissolve in your blood and go back to your lungs. You don't need hemoglobin for that because carbon dioxide has this buffer chemistry that lets your blood hold more CO2 than it would if there weren't any of this buffer chemistry. So uh, when CO2 is added, to uh, seawater, it, it uses up the carbonate ion. The way it works uh, is that the more CO2 you put in, the lower the carbonate ion concentration is in the water. And that's important because uh, low carbonate ion causes calcium carbonate to dissolve. This is uh, an effect known as ocean acidification. <laughs> 
So when calcium carbonate uh, dissolves, I mean the reaction for calcium carbonate to dissolve is um, CaCO3 dissolves to make calcium ions plus carbonate ions. And this is another equilibrium reaction. So the same Le Chatelier's principle that I just erased applies here too. If you remove carbonate ion by reacting it with the CO2, then you shift this reaction to the right to replenish it. So Le Chatelier always tries to make things back into balance. It sort of makes some kind of intuitive sense, I hope. So one of the impacts of, uh, of uh, ocean acidification, um, I mean, CO2 makes this carbonic acid. And so dissolving carbonic acid in water makes the ocean more acidic. That's, that's kind of clear. Or another way to, to, to think of it is the, the the, the balance of the CO2, which is an acid species, versus the carbonate ion, which is sort of a base species. Uh, you have more of the acid and less of the base. Again, that's sort of telling you that the, the chemistry of the water is getting more acidic. And mostly that affects the critters that make calcium carbonate, like, uh, like coral reefs and uh, there are plankton in the ocean that uh, are made of calcium carbonate as well. So that's kind of like the second problem with CO2 emission is it's changing the chemistry of the ocean in ways that may be bad for uh, some of the things that live there. Now the, the overall rate of uh, CO2 uptake into the ocean is limited by the way the ocean circulates. So uh, the, the ocean, the water in the ocean sort of goes down into the deep and then comes back up to the surface on a time scale of something like a thousand years. So uh, this buffer chemistry is good because it allows more carbon to be stored per, per you know, cubic meter of water or gallon or whatever. But the overall invasion of CO2 into the ocean is going to be slow because, uh, because the deep waters in the ocean just don't, just, don't, just don't come up to the surface very much to, let, you know, to talk to the atmosphere, to let CO2 dissolve in the atmosphere. Yeah, question. Yes. Well, it's a good thing for us because it's cleaning up our mess. It's not a good thing for the corals. That's what I meant. Yeah, I've got to be careful with these value judgments, but that's what I meant. Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday.